Peace of Christ be with you. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Share that peace with those around you. Share it. Share the love. Greet each other. All right, Hope College. All right, Hope College. Let's gather up. You sit down now. You sit down. For those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Trigvi Johnson. I serve as the dean of the chapel, which I'm one of your pastors here at the college, one of them. And I just want to say to you, I'm so glad you're here. We missed you over the summer. And I'm glad that we're able to gather in our sanctuary, Dimnet, your chapel, and worship the Lord. It's the beginning of a new school year. And for some of you, the beginning of a new season of life. I love beginnings. Beginnings bring with them the energy of the possibility, the fresh start. The beginning of a school year feels like laundry right out of the dryer. It's just, it's all fresh and new and nothing is stained yet. And yet, if I'm honest with you, and maybe with yourself, Beginnings bring that early excitement and energy and possibility, but it also brings some anxiety, some feelings of uncertainty, maybe even awkwardness. It can feel like everyone around you knows what to do except you. You know where to sit. You know who your friends are. You know what the invisible rules of the social structures are. Everyone but you feels like they're fitting in. I'm going to just let you in on a little secret. Everyone feels that way, even your professors. Those junior high insecurities that you're feeling right now in your, in your belly, they don't go away just because you get old. I guarantee you every time one of your professors grabs, well, we don't have trays anymore, but when they go through the, the line at Phelps or at Cook, they're all wondering just like you, where do I sit? Who do I belong to? I don't know if you ever feel that way. I feel that way. And those beginnings, though exciting, are also, also a time where I feel a little awkward. And if you feel that way tonight, just I want to encourage you, that feeling will pass. As you keep showing up, as you keep meeting people, those feelings of, of, of being new and um, unfamiliar, they're going to go away. And before you know it, this is going to feel like a place that is like a second home to you. I promise you that that will happen. But as you begin, you have to make certain decisions about your life. And as we begin together, I want to give you one simple verse to take with you. I want you to take that verse and put it in your back pocket, or even better, I want you to memorize it with me and let it groove your soul like the best music pressed into vinyl so that again and again you can put your finger on it and it will play the melody that you need to hear. Here's the verse. It's from Acts 2.42. In your pew Bible, it's page 886. Just this little verse. 242. Oops, that's Acts 3. Nope. There we go. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of the bread. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. This is the word of the Lord. As we begin this year together, or as you begin your new academic year, or maybe your collegiate career, I want you to take this little verse. I want you to chew on it and let every morsel and flavor fill your palate. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. And I want to give this verse to you because this is a beginning verse. What I mean by that is if you understand the context of the verse, this is the beginning that launches a worldwide movement. Acts 2. Does anyone know what Acts 2 represents? What context this is? Shout it out, upperclassmen. Pentecost. Pentecost, that's right. Come on. True. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I got you. 
Pentecost. Pentecost is the context of this verse. Pentecost is the birth of the church, the church that went global. Here's the context. The word became flesh and lived among us. The eternal God took the time to wrap himself in flesh, enter into human time and space, and he lived among us. And we saw his glory. He taught among us. He slept among us. He ate among us. He played among us. He cried among us. He lamented among us. He cried out to God among us. And he was crucified. And on the cross, he takes away the sin of the whole world. For all people at all times and in all places, he takes away the sin of the world. He is buried in the darkness of death itself. And on the third day, an angel rolls away the tomb and Jesus awakens, wipes the cobwebs from his eyes and steps into the bright light of a fresh new dawn and declares to everyone with ears to hear, peace be with you. Peace be with you continues to be the gospel message echoing down the canyons of time to us here tonight. He appears to the disciples and to many others. And when he appears to them, he makes a promise He says, I'm not going to stay with you. I have to ascend to my Father and to your Father. But wait for the Advocate. I will send them to you. Read John 15 sometime carefully to hear this promise. I will send an Advocate, the Holy Spirit. Jesus ascends to the Father where he is right now. My friends, Jesus is not a myth or a metaphor for virtue. He is real and he is alive. He is a living Lord. And even now, he is interceding on our behalf next to the next to the Father. And even now, he is pouring out his Holy Spirit. That's the context in which this happens in Acts 2. The disciples are waiting for Jesus to fulfill that promise, the promise for the advocate, the promise of the Holy Spirit. They're gathered in Jerusalem. Jews from all over the world are gathered there. And then suddenly, like like being overwhelmed by a storm, like lightning, the Holy Spirit comes and Hearts are stirred and quickened. They have tongues of fire. And immediately people start speaking in other languages so that they can hear the good news of Jesus. All across the city, people are awakening with faith in this living Jesus who would die but was also risen and is at the right hand of what has happened is the Holy Spirit is here. This is what Peter is trying to call everyone to pay attention to. The people say they're drunk, and Peter says, no, 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 no. This is what, the promise, what was promised by the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, declares the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both male and female, I will pour out my spirit, my Holy Spirit, and they will prophesy. I will show importance in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, sun and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious Lord. And then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter launches into then a diatribe, a, a sermon of such consequence and such power that on that day, 3,000 people become followers of Jesus. 3,000. People hear the good news of Jesus, of the Lord pouring out his Holy Spirit on all flesh, and they give their lives over to Christ. This, my friends, is the beginning of the church. Acts 2 is the seed of the church that begins a worldwide movement. And right now, on every continent on this planet, people have gathered just like this in chapels cathedrals, in huts, in the open air, in storefront malls, in homes and in basements, gathered in hiding, gathered in public to worship the Lord. Why? Because the Holy Spirit continues to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And people continue to hear the Word of God. When the Holy Spirit comes and the word of God is preached. It's a combustible reaction that results in the spark of new life, new creation, resurrection creation. The old is gone and the new has come. My friends, if I don't get an amen for that, (laughs) the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the very spirit of God himself. It is Jesus' spirit. It is the spirit of the Father and it's being poured out. And when you hear 
When you hear the good news of Jesus and you feel that nudge of the Spirit, watch out, my friends, because God is trying to do something new in your life. That's what happens on this day. And on that day of conversion of 3,000 people, what do they decide to do? They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. At the very beginning of the church, people who are new converts, fresh disciples, choose to devote themselves. And my friends, that's the word I want you to hear tonight. They, what? They devote themselves. True. (laughs) They devote themselves. Devote themselves is something that every one of you have to make a decision about because, my friends, you have got the secret to your success, not only in college but to life, will be the answer to the question of what you devote yourself to. Okay? What will you devote yourself to? All of your energy, all of your passion, all of your commitment. You are here for a specific reason. I absolutely believe that. And God is calling you to something. I don't exactly know what it is, but I'm honored that I get to be one of the people at Hope College that gets to walk shoulder to shoulder with you as we prayerfully discern whatever path God's leading you to. But I do know, I do believe that God is calling you and me and all of us to devote ourselves to God. There's this idea sometimes in the Christian world that the goal is just the conversion. Once you kind of get the conversion, you're one and done. I now believe and I can just move on with my life. But these 3,000 young Christians teach us something different. Once they were converted, once they raised their hand, once they walked down the aisle, once they gave their heart and mind over to Jesus, they devoted themselves because they understand that short-term highs have to translate into long-term commitments. We are not meant to live on a mountaintop. We live down in the valley. The Christian life is not one lived on adrenaline. And so you have to make a decision to devote yourself to God in particular ways that are going to allow the roots to grow deep so that you can grow tall and mature in stature. Because you maybe have a high, energetic, passionate experience at the gathering or at camp or at a concert, God needs to translate that experience into a commitment. They devoted themselves. Devotion is every single day. Devote yourself means that you put your lunch pail under your arm and you do the little things, the right things, every single day so that you can be formed, you can be matured in the faith. They devote themselves. You are being called to devote yourself to God. And I want to encourage you with these early young disciples, this orientation class of the church, to devote yourself to four things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is what is we learn about who Jesus is. If you are going to mature in the faith, if you're going to have more than just a flash in the pan experience, but a life that will translate into being a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ for the rest of your days, you're going to need to know something about the apostles' teaching. And you cannot do that apart from the Bible. My friends, there is no growth in the Christian life apart from Holy Scripture. You need the Bible. My friends, get yourself a Bible. Eat the Bible. Tear it out. Chew it up. And it will go down like honey. Honey. This is so sweet. Every word is meant to nurture you. You need a Bible. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes that the most important thing in the Christian life is how we approach the Bible and how we read it. It is our textbook. It is our only source. It is our authority. We know nothing about God and about the Christian life and truth apart from the Bible. We need the Bible, my friends. And we need the Bible not to get more information about God, but because this is a means by which God speaks to us and communes with us. And there are lots of different kinds of Bibles. This is my preaching Bible. This was my college Bible. 
This is the Bible I had in college. My grandma Johnson used to say that a Bible's falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't. I always liked that. Every day, I would, every time I go visit my grandma Johnson, she had a big old Bible in her lap. She had a little uh, blanket over her knees because her knees weren't good. But she was always just had her Bible. She was just always reading it, just reading it. This is my Bible. This is the Bible that I had when I became a Christian at the age of 13. It's fallen apart too. A little NIV. This is one of my most prized possessions. I wrote in under bursts in my cabin, Camp Moran. Today is my birth, the day I gave my mind and my heart to Christ, except I spelt Christ. I don't know. <laughs> August 6th, Wednesday, 1986. This is the happiest day of my life. Today I gave my life to Christ. <laughs> huh. See, so I'm saved, but I'm not smart. It won't be easy, but I'll work at it. Even at age 13, I knew that it was going to take devotion. This is, this is my Greek Bible. This is the Bible I had in seminary where I learned to read the ancient tongue, to translate. This is, this is, this is the big boy Bible. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, oh yeah, it's all right. It's just, that's just nothing. This is, this is, this is the Bible, this is the, this is the preacher's Bible right here. This is the preach, this is the Bible you need to get strong with. This is the Bible James Ellis uses. Right here. Big boy Bible. There are lots of Bibles. There are little Bibles, big Bibles, Bibles in different translations. I don't care what size. I don't care what translation. I don't care what length. But get you a Bible. Because there is no growth in the Christian life apart from the Bible. Because the Bible is what allows us to know who God is. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel. That was promised beforehand through his prophets. The gospel concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. My friends, we cannot know this Jesus without the Bible. Get a Bible. Devote yourself to learning what the Bible says. Take a class on the Bible. Go to the library and check out a commentary. Make time in your day just to simply read it. But see your Bible as a treasure. It's not a puzzle. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it's going to invite you into a world where you will commune with the living God. Amen? Devote yourself to, hold, to the apostles' teaching, to Scripture, and to fellowship. Oh, one of the greatest things about being a Christian is the fellowship koinonia. It, it's, it's more than just regular friendship. It is a, a kind of communing together of a shared passion. When I look back on my life, where I see providence, the hand of God the most, is in my friendships. The people that God has put in my path at just the right time, just the right place, to give me that word or that lecture or that book or that time of prayer together, God continues again and again to bring people into my life to just encourage me to continue to follow him. If you are going to be a Christian long after college, my friends, you're going to have to devote yourself to fellowship. You are not meant to do this faith thing alone by yourself. I like this quote a lot from a theologian and friend, Sam Wells, in a book called Improvisation. And he's talking about the difference between Christians who see the world as their call to be heroes and those who understand that they're called to be saints. And he writes this, of the 64 times the word saint is used in the New Testament, everyone is in the plural. Saints are never alone. They assume, demand, require community, a special kind of community, the community of saints. Heroes have learned to depend on themselves. Saints have learned to depend on God and on the community of faith. The church is God's new language, and it speaks not of a country fit for heroes to live in, but of a commonwealth of saints. Friends, you are meant to belong to a commonwealth of saints. What we're doing tonight is fellowship. You are called to link arms together, to love each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other along the way. 
You are called to let other people encourage you along the way. And to do that, you've got to be open to new friendship, to be surprised. I remember my freshman year in college, I took an introduction to philosophy class with Dr. Wakeham. I sat in the very back of the class, and I thought I was a lot smarter than I was. I thought I knew this, some of this game and the lingo, and I quickly learned I knew nothing. But I had that kind of fresh bravado that you have sometimes when you're trying to be too cool to care. I was sitting next to a young man, Keith Starkenberg, and he had that same kind of bravado. We both kind of snipped each other, and we didn't like each other. We were both trying to compete for the grade. We both thought we were too cool to care. We met each other but didn't like each other. Well, over time and through particular circumstances, this person I sat next to in my philosophy class became a friend, and not just a friend. He became a best friend. He became the best man at my wedding. He became a lifelong conversation partner about Jesus and what it means to love him, what it means to be a husband and a father. And again and again, my friend Keith has been teaching me over the last 25 years what it means to follow Jesus. That person that I immediately maybe rubbed shoulders with that I didn't like, well, God had a different plan for that relationship. I bring that up only to say to you that sometimes the person that maybe you're around right now that maybe rubs you the wrong way may just be your maid of honor, may just be your best man, may just be a friend that will encourage you along the way, because that's the way of Jesus. Jesus is bringing people into our lives to encourage us. And so pay attention to the people around you. Pay attention to those people that God is putting in your life because maybe, just maybe, God has a purpose for that friendship that is larger than what you can see right now. Devote yourself to fellowship. Devote yourself also to the breaking of bread. This was probably meant in two ways within this context. They became Christians and they devoted themselves to hospitality, to breaking the bread, to sharing all that they had with those around them. Their reputation was immediately blessed within the city because these young disciples of Jesus just shared everything they had. They didn't have any sense of kind of ownership or property. If there was a need, that community would try to feed it. What would it be like if the church today had that attitude? And I say that pointed at myself. That we take what we have and we just share it generously because nothing that we have is ours, really. It all belongs to God. They broke bread and they shared it, but I think it's meant in another specific way. It's meant in a way of worship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship, but they devoted themselves to worship. And whenever the early Christians would worship, they would break bread. They would have communion at the Lord's table. They would feast on the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. When we come to the table, my friends, Jesus' real presence is here. Breaking the bread is code for worship. They devoted themselves at the beginning to learning about who Jesus is in the scriptures. They devoted themselves to friendship and they devoted themselves to worship. Eugene Peterson writes that failure to worship consigns us to a life of spasms and jerks at the mercy of every advertisement, every siren, every seduction. Without worship, we live manipulated and manipulating lives. If there's no center, there can be no circumference. Failure to worship sweeps us into a last restlessness epidemic in the world with no steady direction and no sustaining purpose. My friends, if you want a steady direction for your life, if you want a sustaining purpose, then you need to devote yourself to the breaking of the bread. For this table in worship is the center that gives our lives a large circumference of grace. Because here we are reminded that the faith isn't something we do for ourselves. Faith is always and ever a gift. Every week at the gathering, we will gather at this table. And I want to encourage you to devote yourself to that, to come every week. Bring a friend. Bring a friend's friend. Bring a friend's cousin's uncle. Come to the gathering and break bread. Because in the breaking of the bread, all the diversity of the kingdom finds an uncommon unity in God. The story of Pentecost is a story of incredible diversity. People from all over the world are there. 
And yet they all come together and devote themselves in the breaking of the bread. There is a powerful witness, my friends, when we all in our diversity come together and find that uncommon unity in Jesus. Amen? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to Scripture. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to Christian friendship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread, to worship. And finally, they devoted themselves to prayer. To prayer. You ain't slick if you're not praying. You've got to pray, my friends. In prayer, we touch the last reality, says P.T. Forsyth. The people of God are always, always a praying people. Has anyone been over to the new Jim and Marty Boltman Center? You walk through there, you found your spots, your favorite chairs. I like those Captain Kirk kind of chairs. They're up on the second floor, you know what I'm talking about. There's lots of little nooks and crannies and conference rooms. There's lots of new fireplace room. It's gorgeous. I encourage everyone, just take some time to explore the student development team and the caps upstairs. Get to know them. Get to find That's your place. That is your student center. In that student center is a new prayer chapel. Has anyone gone in there? Go in there because that's your chapel. That is designed for you to have time and space simply to pray. Move the chairs around wherever you want. It's your prayer chapel. Use that space to just have time of quiet, to commune with God, to lift up your hearts. In preparation for the transition from the basement schoon chapel to the new Harvey prayer chapel, we have we have um, we have re kind of taken out all these different prayer journals. There's dozens of these in the Keppel House right now. In each one of these journals was a student decades ago, writing down in the Schoon Chapel, praying their heart to God. Page after page after page, students just like you, coming before God, interceding for their family and for their friends. This book is the heart's cry of all God's children, dated March 7th, 1994. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for holy, holy, holy is the Lord. It goes on page after page of people, young adults just like you, Hope College students just like you, crying out to God. And some of these pages are filled with prophetic utterances of a day when there would be, the chapel would be filled. These students were praying for you 30 years ago. You're part of that, my friends. You're part of that. In fact, as we transition into the new um, Schoon Prayer, or the new uh, Harvey Prayer Chapel, this will be one of the first new prayer journals. And what we'd like to invite you to do over this next semester is to go into the prayer chapel. And we're going to have the Big Boy Bible open for you. It's going to be there. And what we want you to do is just pray a psalm. We want you to begin at the very beginning of the psalms. And we want you to simply let that psalm become a language for you in prayer. And then we just want to invite you to journal about it. So I went in today and I prayed Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the paths that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law they meditate day and night. They're like trees planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf never withers, and in all that it does, it prospers. My friends, we want you to take the prayer book of the Bible, and as we dedicate this chapel, as we move into this new space to allow God's word to echo off the walls. So this year, this week, go into that chapel and just pray a simple prayer. If you ever feel overwhelmed, that's your chapel to go to. If you ever need just a quiet space, that is your chapel to go into. It was given by a generous gift of a friend of this college for you. Take your journal. We're going to put all of these journals in the chapel so you will be able to pull them off the shelf and just read the prayers of those that have gone before. And we want to encourage you to pen your prayers, to join that tradition, that 30 years from now, a student at Hope College, maybe one of your kids, might go into that chapel, pull off 
a journal and open it up and read the words of your prayers, of your cries to God. Devote yourself, my friends, to Scripture. Devote yourself to friendship. Devote yourself to worship. And devote yourself to prayer. It's the beginning of a new school year. But don't just make it the beginning of a new school year. Make it the beginning of a new kind of life by what you devote yourselves to. And I want to encourage you as we begin this year, devote yourself to God as if for the first time. Devote yourself to a God who loves you. Devote yourself to a God who is for you. Devote yourself to a God that is inviting you into a consequential life. The really best things in life come to those things that we truly give ourselves over to, truly devote your life to. Half-hearted creatureliness is not the good life. The good life is one where you are fully invested, fully committed. My friends, devote yourself now and forever to this living God who has in Christ devoted himself to you. Amen? Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, on everyone here, Lord, each person. Meet them where they're at. You know what spirit they're in. You know what anxieties and fears and hopes and dreams they have. Holy Spirit, meet each person here and invite them to devote themselves to you. In scripture, in friendship, in worship, and in prayer. In all these ways, Lord, meet us and make us new by the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. And all of Hope College said, amen.